TCS technologies. This is part of the category energy transition, decarbonization, and sustain sustainability track. So this is the first session on this track. I extend a warm welcome to my co-chair, Mr. Ganesh, and all the esteemed speakers in this session, and all the participants, a warm welcome to all of you. So this, is, this topic is on energy transition. Energy transition is the key driver which is driving the transformation of power sector and energy intensive industries. When we say energy transition, we can classify into three pillars, decarbonization, decentralization and digitalization. We call this as three Ds. These are the essence of, this is the essence of energy transition. This topic predominantly addresses the first part, decarbonization. All of us are aware that when we say decarbonization, we have to move from fossil based processes to clean and green processes. So in that context, TCUS technology is playing a very vital role. As all of you are aware, we have made the commitment for net zero at 2070, right? So in order to achieve net zero at 2070, we need to do a lot of work, how we can decarbonize the industry, particularly the hard to abate sector like steel, cement, chemical industries. So that is our main aim, how we can decarbonize this industry. And one of the aspects is by carbon capture, utilization and storage. So in that context, it is very important. And in, in addition to hard to abate sector industries, even if you want to decarbonize the power sector, in India is heavily depending on coal based power generation. Even now we have 60 percentage of the power generation coming from coal as the fuel. So if you want to decarbonize the power sector, one option is we can go for renewable like solar and wind. Other option is we can continue to use fossil fuel and adopt the CCUS technologies so that we can capture the CO2 post combustion from either gas turbine or the conventional unit. So what I want to say is TCUS is very much relevant in the current day context to decarbonize the industries and the power sector. And there are several commercially available CCUS technologies available in Western countries. They are in operation at a large scale and we are having several pilots in India and I am sure this is going to have a greater impact and we are going to work in the near future on several technologies so that we can deploy at large scale and commercially viable. So when we say CCUES, it is not just the capture because we need to see the complete value chain. After capture, we need to see how we can utilize the captured CO2 in a commercially viable manner that is to produce value added products like ethanol, methanol or sustainable aviation fuel. So that value chain is important. So our speakers are going to talk about the CCUS uh, technology. So with these few words, I would request Mr. Ganesh to uh, initiate and start the uh, further presentation. Thank you. Prime Minister is saying about where is the money in India? How can we make? So one thing is that uh, either you go to the alternate energies to reduce the CO2 or capture the CO2 which is already generated. So these are the two options where we need to work upon and because India is using about 75% of fossil fuels. So right now we are generating, generating so much amount of carbon dioxide. So unless we capture this CO2, there is no other fastest route. So that's why CCS is very important today. And as you heard in the morning, that 12.3 is the percentage of ethanol blending in the MS today. So if we can go to 20% by 2025 as uh, told by uh, Prime Minister, so we can do that, achieve the task uh, faster. And in refining industries, basically crude distillations, FCCUs, these are the units which we produce. And coal, as you know, coal gasification units where a lot of CO2 is available. So these are to be converted into this thing. So today we have four groundbreaking sessions from four different uh, uh, sectors. So the uh, presenters I just introduced um, and the brief about the presentations. Basically these are like carbon capture and uh, uh, utilization. So the first session is by integration of post 
combustion capture with natural gas combined cycle by Mr. Ravi Kumar Neeti, uh, is CCS integration leader, GE. This presentation explores about how integration of post combustion capture with NGCC plants not only enhances the plant performance by capturing the CO2 emissions, but also strategically reduces the capital expenditure required uh, for synergizing integration the existing infrastructure. So I request Mr. Uh, Ravi Kumar N to come on to the stage to give his presentation. Please uh, welcome me with a uh, big round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Ravi. So I'm a carbon capture system integration leader for Asia. And uh, along with my colleagues, they are not here with a team from the HQ. So I'm uh, happy to present the, you know, this paper here. So just a background. So this is more on how we can integrate the combined cycle power plant with a post-combustion carbon capture technology, uh, primarily amine-based uh, solvent technology, and followed by how we can improve the performance and the reduce the capex. That's the one of the uh, major concern now, uh, where you know the penetration of the carbon capture is, is limited. So just to give a context of you know where we are coming from, you know why the carbon capture is important here. Uh, so as, as everyone knows about the, you know, the, one of the major challenges we have in the uh, uh, 21st century is uh, climate change. And the background of the climate change, if you see, you know, how the uh, carbon concentration is increasing in the atmosphere. So starting from the pre-industrial era, as we are now, the, the carbon concentration increased from anywhere from 280 ppm up to 400, 420 ppm. And this is causing the, you know, the green, greenhouse gas impact and which is further increasing the surface temperature, which is causing the, you know, ultimately creating the problem for, you know, uh, majority of the things. So that being said, then how we can address this, you know, increasing the carbon concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, so there is a concept called, as uh, might be aware of the stabilization triangle. So if you are continuously going with the present rate, the business as usual, so we are increasing the concentration. There is an increasing in the temperature. We may cross two degrees centigrade as compared to the pre-industrial era. But there are options how we can reduce it. Uh, you know the slope of the the curve, and there are multiple options here. As I mentioned, uh, the renewable nuclear energy, uh, energy efficiency, and the CCS is also part of that. So of six or seven solutions we have, CCS is a one part of that solution. And again, to emphasize that. There is no one solution uh, for this impact, whatever we are having, and it's a combination of all the efforts. So this is a one piece, but if you see the other side of the story, right, there is an energy demand is continuously increasing it. And, you know, the energy in, in an another way, the synonym for electricity is becoming a human right. And, and at the same time, it needs to be uh, reliable, uh, sustainable, and affordable, which, which gave a context by Mr. Raghavan already. Uh, however, whether each of the solution will fit into this matrix is a big problem, which, which we are going to cover a few aspects here. Okay. So comes to the power generation, right? Specifically gas power uh, generation power plants. So are they fitting into the reliable power generation, flexible at the lowest power cost? You know, give a context of it. Uh, gas power plants are more reliable as, as, as we are seeing here. We are talking in the tune of 98, 99 percentage reliability for the gas power plant. Flexible operation, again, we are talking about 8.3 percentage per, per, uh, uh, per one minute. That being said, for a HA power plants, 500 megawatt we are getting in, in, in a span of 12 minutes. So it's a very flexible. Comes to the lower cost, considering the gas availability, gas power plants are very, you know, uh, reasonably well positioned as compared to the anything, even if compared to the renewables, considering the capacity factor in place. But are they sustainable is the question. So gas power plants do emit the CO2 and it is not sustainable with the, you know, the reason which I explained in the previous slide. That's where carbon capture is going to solve the problem. And however, it is not, again, when we add the carbon capture, the cost is going to increase. So when we are trying to solve one problem, we are going to add another problem. So how we are going to solve the problem, you add the carbon capture still trying to make it, uh, you know, Efficient at the same time, inexpensive is all about this this discussion here. So again, little more context on how the entire carbon capture system works. Very very you know few seconds of it. 
it starts from you know the emitters you know, gas power power plants or any power plants in that matter and that we will uh, go into the eop end of the pipe solution we will cool it capture it and collect it and then go to the, the right corner in the compressed one then go to the transport utilization or the storage so if you see the overall uh, value chain here right if we collect less then we can compress less okay so we when we are talking about reducing the energy impact and also reducing the cost we need to keeping that in mind so we want to collect the less so that we can compress less and the storage less and the transport less so that would reduce the cost so if you remove the natural gas combined cycle with the with the coal power plant we are talking about the two times the more emissions which is increases the compress you know compression and transportation and utilization pieces so that's where i would say in a, in a related way i have little better charts to show on this aspect you know how gas is better positioned in view of the compared to the uh, coal uh, with the numbers but so this will give an understanding that we have to collect less we have to capture less so as to reduce the cost so here that's where uh, our solution uh, from the ge what we are offering is on the integration so if you three see on the uh, com capture carbon capture for power plants right there are three pieces one is on the power plant and another is the carbon capture and the third piece about the integration so there are multiple players are there in the capture piece okay so again i would not say it as a commodity but it's pretty much close to the commodity there are multiple players in the power plant again multiple oems are there so we are trying to place our solution in the integration piece how how we can make working the uh, carbon capture with the combined cycle power plant uh, at the same time without reducing the you know efficiency and also keeping the capex at the limited one so going into the details we talk i have more slides on this one talking about the steam integration uh, for the carbon capture solvent kind of solutions amine based solvent solutions need a lot of energy and uh, that generally it takes from the ox boiler but ox boiler also emit the co2 so we are again as i was saying when we are trying to solve the problem it we are creating another problem so how we can avoid the ox boiler and use the steam from the steam turbine is a one option second one is the enhanced co2 concentration so uh, gas power plants emit the co2 in the range of uh, 4 percentage in the exhaust gases it's very less and it increases the co2 cost and how we can increase the co2 concentration we have you know an option called egr exhaust gas recirculation again i'll cover on that part and uh, third one is on the controls and operability again this is a complex piece of machines you know we are combining two plants and how we can make you know uh, keep the reliable intact at the 98 percentage level where our controls and operability and we have a software called serious as uh, a uh, carbon emission software and with a digital solution how we can manage this carbon is another piece which i am going to talk a uh, few few items and the last one about the upgrades so uh, carbon capture as a technology needs lot of auxiliary load initially i said about the steam and another one is about the auxiliary load electrical auxiliary load uh, because of that there is a reduction in the power output but with a multiple ppas in you know uh, power purchase agreement in place customer may not like reducing the power output so how we can manage with a gt upgrades is another option so there are various other 10 options are there but i'm just limiting ourselves for the only the four of them here but again end outcome is that uh, by by following these four approaches uh, we will able to reduce the capex by 20 percentage and again i have some charts to show that and improve the efficiency by 5 percentage compared to the uh, bolt on uh, bolt on i will explain in the next one some basics on this one so if you have a uh, customer looking for or a technology looking for a carbon capture solution we have a something called a bolt on solution where you will add an end of pipe carbon capture for the power plant and take the steam from the auxiliary boiler uh, auxiliary boiler but as i was saying auxiliary boiler also emit the co2 which is adds the co2 emission and uh, but if you see the co2 concentration as i was saying it's around 4 percentage uh, high in the capex low in the performance and we need to have two plant control systems here so so now if go to the an integrated solution which i'm been talking about so similar the end of pipe solution but if you see the first one the steam integration will take the steam from the steam turbine instead of the auxiliary boiler so that we are not adding the co2 emission to the uh, end of the pipe and the steam it's not precisely from the steam but various options from the hrg and the steam to make sure that we have an optimum performance available for the overall plant uh, the second one is on the egr uh, this is the one i was talking about will take 30 to 40 percentage of the exhaust gases cool it condition it and send it back to the gas turbine 
by doing this, adding this loop will increase the CO2 concentration from 4 to, it goes up to 7.5 and 7.8 percentage. So we are uh, precisely increasing by 50 to 60 percentage increase in the CO2 concentration. And another one is because of the EGR, there is a reduction, considerable reduction in the NOx and also reduction in the oxygen. And also because they are taking 30 percentage the loop, the carbon capture size will be theoretically 70 percentage. So, you know, you are uh, theoretically you are reducing the size of the carbon capture plant cost and size by uh, 30 percentage. And because of the oxygen concentration is reduced, the oxidation on the solvent will also reduce. That will reduce the opex of the uh, cap capture plant. Third one is on the upgrades, which I was, uh, will, I'll talk more details, you know, showing some, some uh, photos on the gas turbine one, but uh, we will make sure that we'll upgrade the gas turbine, whatever the power we lose because of the carbon capture one, we'll try to get it out of the upgrade. And another one, the, the controls and operability, there's a one control system, which controls both the gas turbine and the power plant and the capture plant, which also has a digital, uh, digital twin, uh, the solutions we have it, which makes sure that it monitors the, all the solutions precisely. So little more technical details on the pieces, which I just talked about the steam integration. Uh, from the steam turbine point, which I said, instead of ox boiler, we have five, uh, uh, five options here where you can take the steam from the uh, steam turbine, either from the HP, IP, or LP. But if you see that, if you're taking it from the HP, it's a very high enthalpy steam, it will have an impact on the performance, which we don't want to do it. But if you take it on the LP, whether it is sufficient for the uh, ox load, uh, uh, the reboiler requirement of the capture plant is another question. So we'll try to manage it. We will take the permutation and combination of all these five options to make sure that we will use the exact steam requirement as the reboiler without, without you know, overdoing or underdoing it so as to maintain the uh, overall performance of it. So we have an option like let, if you have an, you know, one GT operation or two GT operation, so then how we are going to manage it, you know, the, the reason I mentioned. So if you need a uh, capture plant, need a reclaimer steam that need a high quality steam, we take it from the IP instead of the LP. So this control system will make sure that the correct steam with the correct enthalpy used for the capture plant at any point of time, be it the part load or the uh, full load base load operation without impacting the overall uh, performance of the overall plant. The, yeah, this is another important one is on the EGR. As I was saying, uh, combined cycle power plant have a challenge is that the CO2 concentration is very minimal. We are talking about 3 to 4.5 percentage depending upon the type of fuel we are using. And this will increase as the, you know, uh, capture rates are minimal, uh, it become ineffective because of the amine, limitations of the amine. So how we can increase the CO2 concentration is the, is the option here. So EGR is nothing but will take a, a portion of the exhaust gases, cool it and send it back to the gas turbine in the combustion. So through adding this cycle will, will increase the CO2 concentration. It's, it's a, it's a old technology in the sense, not for the gas turbines, but it's been used in the in the automobile industry quite some time, and uh, and also this is proven that it will reduce the uh, NOx reduction. And as we are speaking, we are multiple tests, full you know full model tests are going on, and uh, how it can improve it. So in overall, EGR will not reduce the performance of the gas turbine, but it will improve the CO2 concentration, which is an ideal case what we are looking for uh, without uh, reducing the performance of the overall plant. The gas of, uh, gas turbine upgrades, which I was talking about, again, just to uh, uh, mention the same same point, because of the capture plan, we need to have a lot of ox load. This will reduce the uh, reduce the power output, and how we can get that uh, back is one one option here. So this is an example of a 7FA gas turbine, uh, which we which we ac actually did this study in uh, US by the Department of Energy. So here, if you have a customer having a DLN 2.6 plus combustor. Uh, it is a ready to use for the EGR. There is no other upgrade needed, but any combustor less than 2.6 need to be up upgraded. So with this upgrade, you know, combustor upgrade, compressor and advanced gas path. So it is such that whatever the power output lose, you know, generally we lose anywhere from 8 percentage to 12 percentage power output because of the capture plant. And the same power output can be added by, by uh, this upgrade. So again, there are two ways, whether it is a traditional upgrade, if the customer want to upgrade their gas turbine, they can upgrade it. But when we are upgrading it, keeping in the mind of how we can improve the performance of when we are integrating with the carbon capture one. So keeping in the mind of the EGR one, keeping it that part load and base load operation, keeping in that, you know, how we can get the most steam from the HRSG and the steam turbine. So we'll, we'll upgrade in a such a way that we will we'll have the maintain the same, same power output uh, with, with the uh, gas turbine upgrade. 
Okay, so this is an important piece, you know, whatever the information which I shared so far, uh, we start with the, the bolt-on capture solution, the red one, uh, case IB1, this is an actual uh, study we, we conducted for uh, DOE. And uh, as we are seeing, going in the right side and the up, so if, the, if you, are we improving the capex, are we are improving the plant efficiency? As we are adding the solution, right, the, we take the bolt-on capture with just ox blower in place, are we adding the steam integration? We are adding the EGR. We are adding the uh, GD upgrades. There is a possibility that we can go up to case 13, which is 20, almost 25 percentage reduction um, in the capex, and also 8 to 9 percentage reduction in the uh, uh, improvement in the uh, plant performance as compared to the bolt-on. So again, just for the comparative, if you see the bolt-on solution, the steam source, as I was saying, ox boiler. Uh, again, keep it in mind that the CO2 emission from the ox boiler need to be accounted. And uh, CO2 concentration is increased from uh, 4 to 6.5 to 7.5 percentage. And uh, uh, capex, capex is reduced, as I was saying, 20 percentage. And uh, plant performance significantly improved. It, we typically say 5 percentage, but in this case, you are seeing that it is improved by 8.5 percentage. And another piece is the plant control system. So uh, this is on the power output also. If you see the performance, when I say performance in the efficiency piece, uh, we are talking about when you add the carbon capture, there is a drop in the performance. But when you are adding the steam integration, when you are adding the EGR, we are not up to the same efficiency level as the uh, independent power plant, but we are reaching up to the closest possible level uh, by adding this uh, uh, integration solutions in that. One more. So few few pictures for the understanding the how how we are uh, how that actual plant looks like. So this is a DOE study we did for uh, customer in US, uh, funded by the Department of Energy. Uh, the 95 percentage carbon uh, capture rate, it's a retrofit for 7FA gas turbine. And uh, we work with the Linde as a carbon capture technology provider. And if you see these uh, lines, those are the EGR lines. And the, the last one is the how the uh, carbon capture island looks like. It has a two observers and uh, one uh, the regenerator. And the overall uh, plan uh, looks like. And the numbers, some of the numbers which I showed in the earliest uh, slide is coming from this study. Some, some little more details on the technical pieces. So for the steam integration, another important piece, how we are taking the steam. So in case of uh, 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 the DOE study, we took the steam from the yeah, yeah, okay. uh, ox boiler. And instead of ox boiler, we are taking it from the steam turbine. And uh, OK, I need to rush out. Uh, so these are how the overall CCS island looks like, uh, in, including the uh, power plant and the carbon capture plant. Okay, so one, one important piece here, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So if you have the coal plant, we are talking about a thousand grams per kilowatt hour of the CO2 emission. And if you move to the gas, which is like 45 percentage reduction without, without doing anything, which is available technology now. Now, if you go into the third one uh, from the gas, that is a combined cycle power plant with a 95 percentage capture, we are reducing the CO2 emission by uh, 97 percentage. Again, considering the uh, fact that availability of the uh, gas is an important factor, I understand that. but Going to the CO2, uh, uh, going to the gas with the CO2, which are available technology now, there is a possibility that we can reduce the emissions by 97 percentage, which which all the world is looking around. So more on the summary of this one again uh, to reemphasize the few points which I mentioned. Uh, CCS integration will improve the performance. It, it's not in you know new technology, but it's more about how effectively we are integrating the carbon capture with the power plant and uh, making sure that. Uh, we are we are not losing the output and efficiency one. Okay, uh, that's all from my side. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Just you can reach out to me. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ravi. Thank you uh, for the wonderful presentation. A big round of applause. There's one learning for me from this presentation. You look, you should look for a higher volume of CO2 and uh, recover it at a lesser cost. Uh, anyway, we'll take up the questions at the end of the session. All three sessions. So I would request uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Ashwin Karmore of uh, BPCL, a senior scientist who is going to share with us a comparative study of primary and secondary amine biphasic solvents. Basically, his presentation dwells around uh, the primary and uh, secondary amines. His exploration evaluates the performance, cost effectiveness, and environmental impact, aiming to provide insights to crucial for optimizing the efficiency of carbon capture process. So please welcome Mr. Ashwin onto the stage. So thank you, sir, <coughs> for the introduction. Uh, I will be presenting a comparative study of primary and secondary amine biphasic solvent for the 
कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड कैप्चर प्रोसेस सो दीज आर द आउटलाइंस ऑफ माय प्रेजेंटेशन विच कंप्राइजेस विच कंप्राइजेस इंट्रोडक्शन बायोफिजिक्स सोलवेंट देन रिएक्शन मैकेनिज्म एक्सपेरिमेंटल पार्ट एंड देन रिजल्ट एंड डिस्कस फॉलोड बाय द कंक्लूजन एंड फ्यूचर्स को so as we all know about that uh, there is a continuous uh, increasing in the greenhouse gas effect uh, as well as global warming due to the uh, greenhouse gas emission mainly composed of co2 and uh, can methane. you make it little louder uh, methane <coughs> so as we can also see in figure 1 there is a net zero set globally for developing countries as well as developed countries uh, to achieve this uh, net zero goal as well as to mitigate the co2 we have the cc cc us technology that is carbon capture utilization and storage technology which is a uh, very vital technology uh, to sustain uh, in future so as you know for uh, CO2 capture. There are several technologies like absorption, adsorption, membrane, and we can say cryogenic also. But among that, uh, absorption is the mature technology. So we are talking about the absorption technology. Uh, here are several options for the liquid-based uh, captures, uh, liquid-based technology for CO2 capture, and it is basically classified into the two categories. That is amine-based and Uh, ionic base so in amine base again there are four classification or four categories the researcher has done uh, work so first is the blended amine solvent where we can blend the primary uh, secondary tertiary and spiric uh, uh, 100 amines uh, to give the high uh, co2 ca capacity as well as low regeneration uh, energy so the main thing is the problem is that or the hurdle is we have to not identify the optimum ratio of that and there is a several other so in non aqueous amine solvent what happen generally we use aqueous uh, traditionally use aqueous amine solution where water is there and which are the responsible for the higher regeneration energy as well as corrosion problem so to avoid that a uh, come uh, non aqueous solution means we have to replace solvent such a solvent who replace the water so that gives the very good uh, low cost uh, regeneration energy but there is a one problem with this technology that is the increasing the rapidly increase in viscosity uh, which will hurdle for the commercial point of view so then there is a biphasic solvent which is the my current uh, topic <coughs> why i choose this uh, biphasic it uses uh, amines and fledge uh, splitting uh, uh, agent which uh, divide after absorption there are two phases like co2 lean and co2 rich phase so only the co2 rich uh, phase we have to regenerate it in regenerated so volume uh, going to the stripping is less so ultimately we will have the less uh, regeneration cost and also uh, <coughs> the more record, more co2 record then there is a uh, new area or new uh, we can say new <coughs> area is there that is catalyst added regeneration people generally do the solid acid catalyst uh, catalyst incorporated with the amine solution and they do the low temperature uh, regeneration but this is at primary stage so we are focusing on the biphasic and then there is some research also going on the ionic liquid uh, purely ionic liquid that is functional ionic liquid that is chemical and second is the blend of the amines and the ionic liquid so what is biphasic solvent here you can say uh, see that on left hand side that is the conventional typical uh, <coughs> process where we have the flue gases which is mixed uh, or uh, mixed together uh, counter currently with the amines and co2 get absorbed in that amines and then it is regenerated fully to the stripper so main thing is uh, the heat for regeneration which is the comprises for sen sensible heat latent evaporation and 
heat of reaction which is very huge and uh, this the critical parameter for the conventional uh, for having high uh, regeneration energy as well as cost operating cost we can say where in biophysic only the site slightly difference is we have the phase splitting uh, agent and then we uh, divide into the or uh, that absorbs co2 get uh, divided into the two phases that is organic co2 lean phase as well as co2 rich phase and that co2 rich phase only going to the stripper so low stripping volume will be required and ultimately we have the low regeneration cost so <coughs> Here we are talking about the primary and secondary amines. So this is the reaction mechanism. It is believed uh, this uh, primary or secondary reaction uh, amines uh, will <coughs> absorb or react with the CO2 and gives the deuterium ions. And this deuterium ions again <coughs> uh, react with the alkaline metals to give the carbamate and this uh, protonate alkaline substance. So this is the experimental part for uh, absorption as well as desorption. So left hand side there is a bubble reactor where the absorption studies and online analyzer is there where we have to capture the, uh, we have recording the CO2 reading and for calculate the CO2 loading as well. In similar fashion we have the desorption setup so that we can do the uh, for CO2 desorption loading also. Uh, this setup is used for the equilibrium study because where this equilibrium study uh, equilibrium solubility is must for the commercial point of view once uh, we should know the how much this co2 get absorbed in that uh, amines so for that we must know the equilibrium solubility study so for that we have used the materials like MEA, MAE, that is primary and secondary amines, and some alcohol base also. And in addition to that, we have the analysis technology that is NMR, viscometer, and density meter also. So, first of all, what I did, we have selected uh, primary and secondary and alcohol based solvent, biphasic solvent, where we do the where the phase change BR is there. So, phase change BR is only found in MEA2 propanol water solvent as well as MEA and MAE N butanol water solvent. So we choose MAE and uh, N butanol water solution for the further study because of it has higher absorption capacity compared to the other. And in others, there is a no phase change behavior observed. So we further uh, modified or further studied the uh, in detail. <coughs> primary and we compare what is the primary and secondary biphasic amine performance. So here we can, uh, we have taken the feed ratio of 3, 1, 6 and only changing the alcohol composition and water composition, rest amine concentration is the constant. Where we can see uh, 3, 4, 3 that combination gives the highest CO2 loading for phase change. CO2 loading for phase change is the must for the absorption process because at that point the phase changes get started and that we have the two phases. So at 343 we have 0.512 uh, mole per mole of CO2 loading which is uh, comparable with the uh, primary amines also. So here we can see these are the NMR graph. So there is a upper layer, bottom layer, upper layer and bottom layer for primary as well as secondary uh, amines where we can see there is a upper layer, there is a mostly the alcohol composition and in lower phase there is a mostly carbamate or car bicarbonate species, ion species are there. Again there is a temperature effect is very important for absorption as well as desorption. So we have further started. Uh, studied in detailed manner uh, at 303 Kelvin where the highest absorption uh, CO2 loading is there and 
at 333 kelvin at the lower uh, co2 leading, uh, loading is there because absorption is the uh, we can say isothermic phenomena in reverse standard fashion there is a desorption uh, where high temperature uh, giving the more CO, uh, more we can say uh, desorb the co2 quickly than the uh, at lower temperature but when we look at this uh, we should trade off between the energy requirement for the absorption as well as desorption process and that process uh, that we have to choose based on the our uh, experimental then uh, this is the co2 equilibrium solubility so i have carried out uh, at two different temperatures what is the their co2 equilibrium uh, uh, capacity for different partial pressure of co2 in the feed so I have taken this N2 and uh, CO2 plus uh, simulated water and then uh, varies from it to uh, P or CO2. So we can see at lower temperature there is a higher uh, CO2 equilibrium, uh, equilibrium uh, solubility of solvent and at lower temperature uh, there is a uh, lower, uh, sorry higher there is a lower and lower there is a higher equilibrium solubility of CO2. Then for industrial point of view, we must know the what is the stability or how this solvent should perform in a long manner. So we have conducted uh, this eight cycle uh, absorption desorption, and we found there is a almost a constant absorption loading as well as desorption loading. So this shows that this solvent is the potential candidate for the uh, commercial or we can say pilot or demonstration scale where we can do the further study. So I, I want to conclude uh, the this study basically the comparative study base, uh, between the primary and secondary biophysic amines uh, where we can see the uh, their performances. So based on this experiment, especially phase change experiment as well as adsorption, desorption and temperature effect, we found that the, the combination of 3, 4, 3 is the best secondary biophysic amines having CO2 loading around 0 0.512 mole per mole uh, which allows the absorbent for the uh, absorber uh, in the absorber in an efficient manner. And then again the temperature effect for absorption as well as desorption we have uh, choose uh, 303 kelvin for absorption that is 40 degrees celsius and similar fashion we have the 353 kelvin for the desorption because if we choose higher temperature of absorption as well as uh, high temperature of desorption that will hamper your absorption capacity as well as uh, energy requirement for the uh, desorption so one must go through the detailed study uh, before going to the uh, commercial scale we must do the pilot or demonstration scale to have the techno feasibility uh, study uh, at uh, on biophysic solvent so these are the references and i want to acknowledge bpcl rng management as well as india energy week uh, who gave me the <coughs> this opportunity uh, and also thank to audience and my chair. So thank you all of you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin. It's a wonderful presentation. You are perfectly in time. This is the first presentation out of these two. And uh, we have a few questions yeah. because uh, many times we use only single solvent. Yeah. So we'll uh, learn a lot after the session. Uh, four sessions, we have a few questions for you. So please be seated. Now I would uh, request Ms. K. Vijay Durga, uh, HPCL scientist from HPGRDC or R&D center to come onto the stage to share her experiences on building up infrastructure that low cost infrastructure for capturing the CO2 and benefit the refineries uh, basically for CO2 capture in the industries. So please welcome Ms. K. Vijay Durga onto the stage, please. Thank you sir for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, this afternoon we'll see one of the next generation low cost CO2 capture technology developed by HPCL. 
So the risk of repetition, I'll give. A, let me give a small brief around why CO2 capture. So as the industrialization expansion uh, began to accelerate in 1900s, it led to rise in the uh, GHG emissions, which consequently uh, increased the global temperature, which had uh, which had uh, resulted in uh, adverse climate change. And uh, to address this climate change and its negative impacts, uh, countries all around the world gathered together in Paris Agreement followed by COP26 and COP27 to discuss the, uh, to develop strategies to, uh, with a goal to reduce the global emissions and maintain the global, temp uh, global temperature raise within the two degrees, which is a safe zone. And one of the main strategies uh, was CO2 capture. Why? Because if you see this uh, profile of GHG emissions, which plots the past emissions and uh, projects the future emissions, if you follow the Pathway of RCP 4.5, which is a safe zone uh, pathway where we limit our temperature raise within two degrees. See, if you see that pathway, we need to reduce, we need to undo our emissions and re and uh, go back to our pre-industrialization level uh, GHG emissions. Meanwhile, if we see our uh, future global energy mix, most definitely renewables play a role and. Uh, they, uh, they fill some space, but at the same time, even though at the reduced uh, percentage, our uh, fossil fuels still play a role to match our growing energy demand. So we are looking at a situation where we have to negate a century worth of emissions while usage of fossil fuels. This just proves beyond doubt that without CO2 capture, we, are not, we will not be able to achieve our climate change goals. So for CO2 capture, we have various technologies at various readiness levels, such as uh, electrochemical adsorption, chemical looping, oxyfuel combustion, and solvent absorption. But among them, the most uh, widely, uh, vastly proven uh, technology and uh, implemented all over the world is uh, amine-based absorption, whether be it be post-combustion or pre-combustion. And in the conventional amine-based absorption, uh, you have there's an absorber column where the feed is introduced from the bottom and the amine is introduced from the top, which is driven by the gravity. And due to this counter current uh, action, the CO2 is uh, dissolved into the amine and, uh, we, and it produces a CO2 free treated gas from the top and a CO2 laden rich gas from the bottom. This rich amine is preheated and sent to a regenerator column where it is heated up to 120 degrees to liberate almost pure CO2 from the top and a lean, a lean amine from the bottom. This lean amine post dissipating uh, its energy from the incoming rich amine, it is recirculated back to the absorber. So our main goal at HPCL was to reduce the cost of the CO2 capture technology so that we can vastly implement this technology and accelerate our goals towards the climate, uh, goals of climate change. So the main two cost components of this technology were, which are CapEx and OpEx. When you see the OpEx, the major component is the regeneration energy, which is because we conventionally use primary amines, which have, which uh, because of its high reactivity with, uh, towards CO2. But the very high reactivity would result in a high re requirement of high regeneration energy because it requires higher energy to break the CO2 bonds. So at H HPCL, we have developed a blend of amines. We call it HP amine. So we blended various types of amines, which would result in reduction of OPEX, uh, therefore the regeneration energy up to 20 to 30%. So when we come to CAPEX, as I mentioned, the driving force in this particular process where the, where the lean amine is driven by gravity, the gravity being a poor uh, driving force, the reaction kinetics are very poor due to which the, we require generally huge columns to attain the design separation efficiency. So to reduce the capex, we turn to process intensification. So process intensification is any development that leads to sustainable, sustainably a smaller, cleaner, safer, and a more energy efficient technology. In a process intensified process, uh, the transport rates, either be mass transfer or heat transfer, are enhanced. And all the molecules of the operating fluids are subjected to same process, uh, same processing experience. So this would result in a much, uh, uh, this would result in improved control of the reaction kinetics, higher energy efficiency with a reduced capital cost and reduced inventory. So how do we implement process intensification in our absorption process? To understand this, we need to understand what is the uh, process happening in the conventional column. 
So in a conventional trade column, we have a pool of liquid from which a gas is passing through and the CO2 is absorbed from the gas to the liquid. So to enhance this, we have a packed bed where the liquid, for, liquid flows in the form of a thin layer over the packing. So the uh, development uh, between these two is the, the interfacial area. The gas liquid interfacial area has been enhanced and therefore the separation efficiency has been enhanced. So this uh, gas liquid interfacial area plays a key role in enhancing the efficiency thereby, thereby the capex of the, thereby the size of the equipment thereby the capex of the unit. So to further enhance this reaction, uh, reaction kinetics, we used rotating packed bed. So imagine you take a packed bed and you rotate it at a certain RPM and then you introduce a liquid into this rotating packed bed. Due to this in, uh, enforced centrifugal forces, the liquid is broken into tiniest droplets which has the highest surface area. So because of this enhanced gas liquid interfacial area, the mass transfer rates are increased in a magnitude range depending on the RPM you have imparted to the packed bed. So using this rotating packed bed and the concept of process intensification, we at HPCL, we have developed our HP high gas techno sorry, technology, which uses, uh, which uses high centrifugal forces and high surface area packing to enhance the mass transfer rates. Due to the enhanced mass transfer rates, the HCTP, uh, therefore that is the overall height of the column, have been uh, reduced drastically in uh, 10 to 20 times, depending on the magnitude of the centrifugal force you are imparting to them. So based on this technology, we have put up a H2S removal plant and also the design of the uh, design of the technology is so flexible that you can design it for various operating conditions. So to understand uh, this schematics uh, explains the working of high gas technology. So, uh, so we have a high surface packing element which is enclosed in a casing and it is attached to a rotor and uh, and the rotation is induced onto this packing. So the, onto this rotating packing, the liquid is introduced via this liquid distributor and it's sprayed on this rotating packed bed. So due to the centrifugal force, the liquid is split into tiny droplets. At the same time, uh, the gas is introduced from the outer periphery of this packing and, due to, and uh, it is driven by the pressure difference and it moves towards the center of the packing. So due to this counter current action and the enhanced, uh, ma enhanced surface area between the gas and liquid, the mass transfer increased drastically. So, ba uh, so based on this uh, technology, we have put our first commercial unit in our very own Wysak refinery to process around 4 point, uh, to process, uh, to, pro to remove for the removal of H2S uh, in uh, 2014. It is designed to process around 14 tons of, uh, 14 tons per hour of gas to reduce uh, H2S from around 4.7 weight percent to less than 100 ppm at a 5 bar. So based on this uh, unit, we have observed a plant size reduction up to 10 times, which is depicted in, sorry, which is, which is depicted in, uh, which is depicted in this particular picture, which is uh, on your uh, left side where you have this uh, huge column, which is the conventional column, which is supposed to process the same feed as the high gas. So that particular column is around 23 meters, whereas in the side we have our high gas technology, which, is, uh, uh, which, is, which can handle the same capacity as the column and which is around only 2.5 uh, meters height. So this proves a uh, plant size reduction of almost 10 times and has proven this technology at industrial, industrial level. So based on the, due to this enhanced performance of high gas technology, uh, high gas is, uh, high gas can change the landscape of CO2 capture. Why? Because it is a proven technology and due to the size reduction, we can provide a modular CO2 capture solution and due to the low, uh, due to the size reduction, it is, and uh, also, um, sorry, and also it is adaptable for all kinds of liquid, gas liquid separations. And uh, it is a safer process because of the low inventory and it, it has a lower capital cost. It is observed in our previous units up to 25% of savings were observed. And it is best solution for retrofits, retrofits and revamps. So because of the small, uh, small size of the unit, it can be easily retrofitted on existing congested refineries. Also for an upcoming unit, it would require a very small space. And because of the small sizes, the ease of maintenance increases drastically. And also, in you know, offshore applications where uh, because of the swaying, mo uh, swaying motions, 
the uh, lo the inventory is less in this particular unit therefore the swaying motions does not affect the inventory therefore the process of the unit therefore it is most suitable for the offshore application so based uh, due to this and uh, due to due to the said advantages a uh, high gas unit for co2 capture is put in our hpcl vizag refinery to process around 4.3 tons per hour of feed gas which is an hgu gas hgu outlet slip stream which contains around 23% of co2 and has the capacity to capture around 72 tons per day of co2 and it is also facilitated with a compressor and a bottling facility so that the produced co2 can be compressed and converted into a form which will be suitable for the for the usage of the beverage in this beverage industry also uh, due to the co2 capture plant the uh, the downstream psa unit uh, h2 recovery increases by 0.25% this particular project is in advanced stage and is and is it estimated to be completed by this year so uh, also with in combination with our in house hp i mean uh, the opex is estimated to reduce by 30% so for comparison we have designed a conventional column for which has the capacity to process the same as what we have what uh, high gas is designed to for that particular process capacity the conventional column is around 40 meters whereas the high gas we are putting up is around 3 to 4 meters proving the size reduction of all for more than 10 10 times so parallelly we have uh, glad to announce that uh, we are uh, we have uh, uh, partnered with kbr for the licensing of high gas technology uh, and we have together with kbr we have developed kcap technology which provides a complete uh, co2 capture solution and it is suitable for uh, capturing so, uh, capturing co2 for various kinds of uh, feed providing uh, providing solution for all range of industries so apart from high uh, apart from co2 technology uh, sorry co2 capture high gas technology can be used for other applications such as natural gas sweetening, ship, ship exhaust treatment such as SOX removal, thermal regeneration of solvent, offshore gas treatment, pot uh, petrochemical separation processes and as well as distillation. So in conclusion, uh, climate, uh, so in conclusion, climate change and global warming are proven beyond doubt and the CO2 capture is inevitable to achieve our climate change goals. And but uh, the conventional process are uh, capital intensive and would require huge columns to achieve our goals. But as a solution, HPCL has developed HP high gas technology, which is modular, which is modular, safe, low apex, low capex, and with uh, combination with our HP, I mean, would require lower opex as well. And it is easy uh, is a easy solution for retrofits and revamps. And apart from CO2 capture, high gas technology has a gamut of applications. Thank you for your, uh, thank you all for your time. For more details about high gas technology, I request all to visit our uh, uh, HPCL stall with a live 3D model. I can assure you the experience would be much more enriching. Miss Vijaya, for the insightful presentation, it's a great work reducing the CO2 from 4% to less than 100 ppm, and there is a live uh, project which is there in Vishak refinery of uh, HPCL, and they also have a demo plant at R&D HPC R&D center. And it is great to know that we are already collaborating with Kellogg's for commercialization of this project. Thank you very much. We'll take up your questions at the end. Now, at the end, uh, we have the fourth presentation by the most experienced person in the research and development, Mrs. Somendra Banerjee, uh, who is coming onto the stage. Uh, so far, we have been discussing about absorption, uh, gas liquid absorption, CO2 capture. Now, we'll be looking forward for, from your presentation, sir, how to utilize this and technology is available. And uh, I understand that UOP is already uh, offering technologies outside India for capturing the CO2 and then uh, storing. So we'll be looking forward for uh, more insights from you. Please go ahead, sir. Let me start by thanking the organizers for giving us an opportunity to come and talk about you. No? Is OK now? to talk about our carbon capture technologies today. I am not going to, I'm not going to repeat the need of decarbonization, and uh, especially for India where coal is and will continue to be a major part of the energy mix. 
But as our session chair said that the three things which is extremely important, starting with decarbonization, digitalization, and energy transition. I think I will start by saying that Honeywell has offering, proven offering across all these areas and has been helping global customers to reach their net zero goals using this. So today our topic is decarbonization, mainly a part of decarbonization, which is carbon capture. Note. Which is carbon capture, is that not audible? And uh, we are going to see how, not only how UOP captures the carbon dioxide, but also as was mentioned, how to valorize that carbon dioxide and, and take it to something like sustainable aviation fuel or intermediaries like green olefins or green chemicals. Okay, so this is just to keep in mind that during the course of the presentation, there may be some statements, particularly on the market outlook, which will have some assumptions built in, in it. So just to keep yourself aware that the, of this uh, thing during the session. So the Honeywell uh, carbon capture technologies. Now this is <clears throat> this is not something new to Honeywell. The, the, the need to capture CO2 and the need to use CO2 has been in our portfolio for a long period of time. And you will see that we will go through, take you through the different way Honeywell has been capturing, UOP has been capturing this carbon dioxide from different applications, be it natural gas, be it in, in, in some applications like fertilizers, chemicals. fertilizer chemicals, and then how we are taking this CO2 some to useful products. So I'm not going to repeat what is written in the slide here, but as you can see, the application is across the spectrum of areas. So it may be a high pressure system like a syngas, where the syngas is being killed by taking out CO2. It can be a low pressure system where it is a fuel gas or it is a coming from a furnace or from a <clears throat> uh, thing where we are using to capture the CO2. So at various pressure, for example, the, the syngas side can be at a higher pressure, whereas the flue gas side will be at a very low pressure where the gas has maybe a dilute concentration of CO2. <clears throat> So this gives a spectrum of how the pressure of the CO2 on the feed gas and the pressure of the CO2 which you need in the product can determine the technology which we provide. So as you can see, depending upon like a Benfield process, everybody knows that it is used in the fertilizer sector where you are producing... Sir, lower your product. mic, lower your mic, that side. So where it is being used to clean up the gas before it goes to the ammonia section. So, and the applications, you see there are multiple applications across the globe that we have done. But if you look at it on the whole, you will see that it is classified into two broad columns. One is the post-combustion, which is after combustion, the low pressure gas, and the other is pre-combustion, that before combustion, we are capturing the CO2, where you have the advantage of a high pressure and you can put into application things like membrane <clears throat> and other things. And the purity of the final product is also important. There are certain applications <clears throat> I'm sorry. There are certain applications where hydrogen is also recovered as a product. So this one clearly shows that the difference between the two. If you can see the pre-combustion scheme where <clears throat> it's basically the illustration here is a hydrogen production unit where you do the reforming and then the, after the shift reactions where you get more CO2 and hydrogen. 
The PSA, EOP is a leader in the PSA design, separates the high purity hydrogen, and the CO2 can be captured and taken it out. Taken out, <clears throat> it can be compressed and then sent to different applications. So, and whatever application is goes to, this process is capable of delivering that. <clears throat> the other side is the post combustion, where the CO2 comes with the flue gas, the pressure will be low, the CO2 will also be diluted. And here we use our advanced solvent to capture this CO2 and then deliver it for the secondary use. <clears throat> Normally, when you go to the post-combustion side, you face some challenges because you do not control the quality of the flue gas which depends upon the fuel that is burned. So you will see things with like socks, knocks, and particulate matter which is coming with the, with the flue gas, which is also at a low pressure. So there are certain challenges to bring the adequate solvent which can withstand this kind of very, very challenging working condition and still give you a long life. So these are some of the things which we say that pre-treatment can help. It's not that our solvent will not work, but the solvent losses is increased unnecessarily, whether you can avoid it by doing some pre-treatments. The various things like in socks, the SO3 is very important, so, so that it doesn't form aerosol. And in, <clears throat> and in NOx, NO2 is very important. So you can see we have highlighted different ways in which the NOx concentration can be controlled. And particulate matter removal, I am not going to say that you are well aware of the different means. But this is our latest addition to the portfolio. This is the advanced, the advanced solvent carbon capture process. It is conceptually, it is not different from the configuration of a amine unit. But the improvements you can see are highlighted in 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 way. Uh, you can see the three red things, right? So this advanced solvent gives you enhanced mass transfer even at a very low partial pressure of CO2. So the absorber, the packing heights can be reduced, and you can get a smaller capex uh, unit. Similarly, the heat integration has been done in such a way that it is one of the lowest in the industry. If you see, it is only 2.1 gigajoule per ton of CO2 captured. It is one of the lowest thing uh, <clears throat> energy consumption. And the other advantage is because the solvent is so robust, it is very stable. So you can operate it up to a higher pressure. So if you can operate the regenerator at a higher pressure, your CO2 will come out as a higher pressure and your compression cost goes down. Because if you are downstream, if your pressure is high, you can always avoid one stage by operating the regenerator at a five to six kg pressure. So this is the biggest advantage of the solvent that provides to this technology today. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> here is some other examples, a little bit detailed to see how we do it with a natural gas reforming unit. And you can see that after hydrogen purification, the high purity liquid is taken from the CO2 fractionation section. So we have our uh, in our portfolio the CO2 fractionation system where we can cryogenically uh, recover the CO2 as a very pure liquid and then it can be delivered based on your need whether as a liquid or a vapor at the battery limit. This is a slightly detailed more expansion of how you do it in a hydrogen unit. And you can see that how, after the dryer, the fractionation system gives you the pure CO2, and then the thing is recycled back. So this is something where we can do enhanced hydrogen recovery. We can even recover the hydrogen from the tail gas, which is kind of unique to EOP systems because we know the PSA so well. We can integrate it with the PSA and give an added benefit of hydrogen recovery along with the pure CO2 recovery. And this is something which you will very proud to say that one of these, we have uh, been able to work with ExxonMobil and this unit licensed by EOP is in a capacity of 7 million metric tons of CO2 capture per annum. The CO2 goes underground there because they have geological areas to put it in. <clears throat> but it shows the amount of capacity that, our, uh, that the design can handle and the purity levels that both the hydrogen and CO2 can attain.
just a comparative cost on the different ways the CO2 capture processes are. And if anybody is interested with their typical feed properties, then we can always work with them and give you a solution. Now let us talk about, <clears throat> as you highlighted, that there is a need to take this to sustainable aviation fuel. This is one of the pathways that we have to valorize the capture CO2. Anything which today you have heard the terms of e-fuels, right? So anything to do with e-fuels will have to have carbon dioxide as well as green hydrogen. So this is the this is must essence for that. Now once you capture the carbon dioxide and green hydrogen, there are pathways to go to different kind of fuels. One of the one of the original ideas that we knew about or people used to talk about is the Fisher crop process, where you can take these molecules over the catalyst, but the problem of the process was that you cannot actually control the chain length. It goes to a high chain length and you need high pressure hydrocracking at the end to basically go to that selective molecules which you need for SAP. Now, <clears throat> when EOP looked at it, we realized that we have already got commercialized, well-established technology that gave us the confidence to use those technologies in a slow scheme to create SAP from these two. Added to that was the Honeywell automation and the safety system which make this more robust. So this, <clears throat> so this is a highlight of the system that you have the stored CO2. You can capture the CO2 using EOP processes. The green hydrogen, again in green hydrogen we have an offering on the catalyst coated membrane for almost the main PEM and AEM type of electrolyzer. That leads to the synthesis of methanol. Now, when I, when I talked about methanol, why did we choose methanol? Because methanol pathway is proven. Methanol is a stable liquid, can be transported over distances. And when you work with methanol, you can actually dehydrogenate it to get the olefins, which can then be oligomerized to actually attain the chain length that we need. We don't have to basically hydrocrack it back to the chain length. If it, is, if it is sap, then it is the chain length, as you know, for kerosene. So we can exactly get the selectivity to go to that carbon chain length. And <clears throat> so the dehydration will create the olefins. Oligomerization will build the carbon number with the olefins. And then we have a very low pressure hydrogenating step to saturate it to isoparaffin so that you get all the properties of sap. If the customer is interested, we can attune this process and go to HVO or diesel. I should not say HVO, but renewable diesel. So you can go up to a higher chain length and you can deliver diesel from it. Although not shown in this depiction, as I said, once you get methanol, we have other pathways. The EOP MTO process produces light olefins. So it's an established process. It has seven units already operating and many other licenses. So this process can produce ethylene and propylene from MTO. Now you can decide to stop at this point and get, take these green olefins to, to integrate with your cracker or other units. Or you can choose to proceed and go to SAP or, or diesel. So very proud to say that we have already licensed our first unit from methanol to jet, and this is for a company called Hilo Innovative Fuels. In, it's, a, it's a very big unit. It's about uh, 1,400 uh, KMT of methanol processing. And uh, this shows the kind of confidence customer already has on EOP's technology, because it is built out of existing commercially proven technology, so that risk is totally taken out. And it's just a question of that the economics of the demand and where you have the optakers for the sale. So one more minute. I think this is the last slide. So yeah, we can take questions. Thank you, Mr. Banerjee. Can I request uh, the other three speakers to come onto the stage, please? Request my co-speaker, Mr. Raghavan, to come. 
hello hello thank Can you all here? four of you for the wonderful presentation uh, partly talking about capturing the co2 and then converting that into jet fuels and then storing in, uh, through cryogenic processes and uh, through absorption and uh, uh, supplying to the customers for energy recovery for oil and other uh, things we need to think of uh, as a customer and user what uh, generator of the carbon dioxide what we'll be looking for is basically how do i reduce my infrastructure so if i use double solvents and triple solvent primary secondary and all then maybe settling separation then it requires additional infrastructure so these kind of uh, uh, economics you need to see when you are thinking of developing these projects and again recycling again also adds to my cost of heating and then uh, wastage of energy so i don't know how to improve the energy efficiency in this kind of uh, processes and uh, one established technology hyg is already there so we need to see how efficiently this rotating equipment uh, efficiency can be sustained over a period of time in a process where industries have got lot of dirt along with the gases and uh, other uh, areas where we need to work on is capture the co2 but capture it pure how do we make it pure along with impurities you capture then it will not be useful for the uh, customers end users so what is the purity of carbon dioxide we are capturing or rather we don't make it contaminated by using alternate combustion uh, methods like uh, oxygen enriched combustion rather than using air or something like that so these are my ideas so i request mr raghavan if you has any ideas hello hello you are able to hear no hello hello yeah now it's okay yeah first of all i would like to thank all the present all the four presenters for the informative and insightful presentation we had four presentation in this session the first one was uh, on the carbon capture for a gas gas turbine based uh, power plant how we can capture the co2 post combustion in gas based power plant and we had two presentation one by bpcl and another one by hpcl on the various co2 capture technologies what bpcl and hpcl are developing so we uh, they talked about the technology being developed by uh, their respective companies and we had the final presentation by uh, the hanivel uh, mr banerji from hanivel on how we can utilize the captured co2 for the value added products like uh, sustainable aviation fuel so all these four presentations were insightful and informative i am sure you would have had some uh technical information from this presentation we have five more minutes and i would like to uh open the floor for any questions if you like to have any questions please from the yeah. audience we can have to my four speakers yes sir or three questions so that we will be able to complete the uh, presentations on time yeah hello uh this question is to you Uh, sir, actually, when you are telling CO2 to methanol, uh, is it direct hydrogenation or again you are converting to CO and then to methanol? Is asking conversion of uh, captured CO2 to methanol. Is it direct hydrogenation or some other intermediate process is there? CO2 to CO. So both. So there are there are licenses which provide both these technologies. You can either go directly, or you can go two steps. You can first do from CO2 to CO, and then you go there so so both technologies are on offer eop at this point we do not have this technology but we are working with our partner we are open to work with any partner if the customer has in mind so because our co2 uh, you mentioned about purity sir so the co2 product which we produce we can meet purity specification required for any downstream industry whether be it methanol be it going to be the urea production So 99% plus we can hit with our ASCC, which I forgot to mention, but it is relevant in this case. So both the processes exist. So we are we are since equally open to any of these processes to take it to methanol. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Thank you once again for all the presentations uh, and the knowledge sharing. Uh, great. You.
big round of applause to all these uh, presenters thank you all thank you